If listening to Unforgotten has inspired you to create your own podcast, you're in luck. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can make your own podcast and share it with the world. And the Spotify platform makes it super easy to get started. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter where you are when an idea hits, you're ready to start recording. Spotify for Podcasters makes it easy to distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Plus, you can do video podcasts and engage with fans through Q&A and polls. You can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters and sign up for your free account to start recording and sharing your podcast with the world. This week on Unforgotten, they get this call about his truck. They go check the lake house. Mont's not at the lake house. And after returning to the farm, the Hileys noticed things that Dr. Hiley hadn't noticed on Saturday. Mont's wet boots beside each other on the front porch. His pants are in the bedroom. It looks like he's literally just stepped out of them. And his cell phone, along with $100 cash, was still in the pocket. He didn't have a car. He didn't have his phone. He didn't have any money. Things aren't adding up truck was fine and the golf cart was fine it don't make sense nothing broke down for him to have to walk somebody's got to know you know I mean, obviously they know more than they're saying there is somebody involved who doesn't want any information to come out and they keep quashing they're calling this crime and that there are persons responsible well, that would only make sense for a grand jury and everything governor's office wouldn't issue something unless they had some kind of probable cause or at least reasonable suspicion that a homicide or something would have occurred. I don't think he left the camp voluntarily. Hey everyone, this is Sellers. And this is Stormy. And And this this is is Unforgotten. Unforgotten. Where each episode will highlight unsolved missing, murdered, and suspicious death cases in Alabama in order to raise awareness and hopefully obtain some answers for victims and their families. Please remember that any individual referenced in the podcast should be considered innocent until found guilty in a court of law, and any opinions or views expressed in the podcast are solely those of participants. Listener discretion is advised, as some of the content discussed in the podcast may contain violence or graphic descriptions and may not be suitable for all audiences. Be sure to join our Unforgotten Patreon channel today to gain exclusive benefits, including early access to ad-free episodes and bonus content. By subscribing, you'll also be supporting the efforts of ACCA in assisting families in raising awareness for Alabama cold cases. And now for our Part 3 series finale of Mont Hiley. How did the Seagrist react as far as they call and say the Tahoe's there and you guys go out there outside of that first day? Kind of what was their reaction? The reaction was the weirdest thing you could imagine. Number one, they didn't acknowledge that it was Mont's car to begin with. Number two, as the investigation proceeded, we were told that every individual that lived on County Road 30 was represented by Dale Segrist and they could not be interviewed without him being present. Now, you know, you tell me that that's normal. The whole thing was, it was just a mess. I mean, and, you know. and as everybody was there hunting for Mont, they sat on their property and wouldn't let anybody on their property. The whole thing was strange. I mean, you know, it just screamed cover up. You know, if you if you did something or you knew something and you didn't tell and one of your friends died, I mean, that'd be hard to live with. Tell us who you are and a little bit about yourself and who you are in relation to all of this. My name is Brittany Segrist is my maiden name. Um, I'm a Smith now. I'm married with two kids. My husband is actually from Mobile. We met at a hunting camp. <laughs> we are into sports. We, are, we play football and baseball and softball. I'm an um, aerospace engineer here in Tallahassee, oh, wow. so um, <laughs> that's the gist of it. But um, I am actually related to uh, Mike Segrist and them. My dad is Bob Segrist, and him and Mike are 
their cousins and we used to I mean you know like family hang out and we would hunt with them and everything and um, my dad when he was alive he lived right across from the back 40 actually where they found uh, Mont. So Sunday morning November 30th Dale Segris called the Hileys to let them know that Mont's Tahoe was parked at their family camp which was also located on County Road 30 approximately two and a half miles or so from the Hileys farm. After receiving the call from Dale Seagrass, Mont's parents headed to the Seagrass family camp. When they arrived, they discovered Mont's wallet with $200 cash in it, keys in the ignition, hunting rifle, and a briefcase were still in the SUV, which is bizarre, you know. It is. And the windows were also still down. Right. Like they yeah. Were rolled down. Yep. Almost as if he rolled down the window to talk to somebody and then got out and that's it. Well, you know, when his window's being left down in, in late November in Alabama, it, you know, if he did it himself, I would think that he didn't intend on being out of the vehicle for just a few minutes. Mm-hmm. That's not something that I think he would roll the windows down and, and intend on leaving it for a long period of time. Because, right. you know, that time of year and he's got stuff in there and he cares about, you know, men are usually particular about their, their trucks and, and, and SUVs and stuff. And mm-hmm. I just, I think if he did drive it there, then that's where something happened. Papa had just had total hip replacement surgery and he was still in recovery. He couldn't walk or anything. And just to be clear though, pa- Papa is what you right, called your yeah. dad. Um, Bob Segrist. Okay. But me and my cousin Brandon had gone and seen him uh, that Friday night. And um, I hadn't seen him since he had gotten home from the hospital. So we were there, and I still had a curfew. You know, I was young. Even though I was there seeing him, you know, I still had to be home at a certain time. And it was about, I remember looking at the clock, because we drove by right here. So I'm leaving my dad's house, which is right across from about 40, coming back towards Tallahassee. And we're passing Mike's house, where his house is now. And I saw a couple of people up there under the shed, and they call it the boondoggle. Um, But it's just, you know, where everybody hung out after we would, you know, hunt or, you know, watch the football game or whatever. And I saw a couple of people up there, and it was, I didn't know at the time, but it was Mont Hollis Tahoe. And there was a truck behind him. And we were going to go up there, you know, talk to everybody. But it was, I remember looking at the clock, it was... I can't remember if it was like 11.15, 11, but 11.18 stands out to me for some reason. So it was close to curfew. So we just went ahead and kept driving. Did we ever look up the weather on that day? According to Weather Underground, it was in the low 40s that night. Which so is it's pretty not, chilly, yeah. Yeah, it's not like he was riding around with the windows down, I wouldn't think, anyway. Yeah, that makes me think even more that it was almost like he may have rolled it down or whoever was driving rolled it down to talk to somebody before they got out. At like 9.53, it was 40 degrees. Yeah. According to weather underground. Not raining. It was cloudy earlier in that day, but it says that night was fair. And then the 29th was basically still the same kind of weather. It was fair weather, but it was actually even colder. So the temperature was basically in the mid to high 30s during the day. I think the max temperature that day was 52. Um, Yeah. And it dropped down into the low 30s that night. Then the 30th was also a fair day. No cloud coverage at all. No partially cloudy, no nothing. Which usually makes it colder at night. In the early morning hours, it actually got into the high 20s. Ooh. But it looks like the max on that day was 59. And by that night, it was back into the 30s. Yeah. So, so it was chilly. There's a range, but it's definitely chilly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The Hileys and a Seacrest family member checked around a duck pond located on the Seacrest property for any sign of Mont. Dr. and Mrs. Hiley recalled Dale saying he did not know who the truck belonged to and that it must be drug related because it had a Florida license plate. But one thing was that when we went to the Seacrest house, Dale looked at us like he didn't know who we were. And he walked around the car and he says, ah. Florida tag. I believe he was driving drugs down here. I mean, talk about stereotyping. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that is bizarre. And then not to mention 
there's an article out there that was written by Alyssa Segrist. Oh, yeah. On a website called Scary Carries. And according to that article, the Segrist did have a small social gathering that weekend. And they noticed Mont's Tahoe parked on the property, but they didn't think much of it because they knew the Hollies well. Mm -hmm. So they saw it. They knew it was Mont's Tahoe, but they didn't think anything about it because they knew them. Exactly. Yeah. But yet they're telling Dr. Holly and Gail, I didn't even know whose truck it was until we looked right. at the ID and must be drugs. Yeah. That's it's weird. Just, That's that red flags. I mean, why not just leave it? I mean, even if I say anything, you know. Well, the next day we went up there, you know, Mont's Tahoe is behind uh, Aunt Ella's house, which they call Granny. So... Mm -hmm. I remember walking over to the truck, you know, just being around all of them and them talking about it. His cell phone, his wallet, they were sitting on the console. I don't remember a briefcase or anything. I just remember that sitting on the console of his Tahoe. Um, the windows were down. Uh, the keys were in the in the truck. Um, we were out there again that Sunday, and I remember Dr. Hiley coming up there in his truck. Dale Segrist and Betty were out there. They were still, you know, talking about his vehicle being there and they didn't know what was going on. With no sign of Mond at the camp and his truck seemingly abandoned, the Hylias drove to their Lake Martin house to see if Mont was or had been there. When Mont was not at the lake house, they returned back to the farm. We decided that we would go to our place up at the lake that maybe he had gone up there. So we drove to our place at the lake and uh, went in. Of course, he wasn't there, but uh, he had been there. There was one bed that had been slept in on one side, and there was a, like a plate in the sink. Yeah. And uh, so we uh, started back in, and I told Gail, I said, you know, I said, I don't know what's going on, but I need to start checking the hospitals. And as we drove back in, I started calling the hospitals if anybody had been admitted, if any John Doe had been admitted or whatever. And of course, nobody had. We called Leanne and Mark, and they came up there, and, and I'd look, gone into the bedroom, and I said, you know, Mark never went anyplace without his telephone, and it didn't even answer, you know, when I, I called, it doesn't. Every time I dial, I would dial again, and his, pa his pants were wet, and in the pocket, there was his phone. He was just on, and it was in his pocket, you know, and he would have never left without his phone. But, you know, at that point in time, we decided he didn't have a car, he didn't have his phone, he didn't yeah. have any money, and something had to be up. Mm -hmm. So, we called the Macon County Police Department. Uh, they sent their investigative team out, and there was uh, four or five of them who came out, and they walked around, and they looked, and they ended up uh, walking out in the woods. And, I, and my thought was, you know, maybe he went hunting. Maybe he had fallen out of a tree, and he was injured in the woods somewhere. I was living in California, but I came right home. I mean, Dad called me, you know, and... I was at work and my dad never calls me. So immediately, like the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. I'm like, what's wrong? And that's when he's like, your brother's missing. And I was like, what? What do you mean he's missing? He's not missing. And then they proceeded to tell me everything. And I got on the first plane and came home. I mean, it was, it was a traumatic experience. So somewhere around 5 p.m. we are at now. When the Hileys were unable to get in contact or locate Mont and none of his friends had seen or heard from him, they contacted the Macon County Sheriff's Office and reported him missing. And that's when they start noticing, wait, there's more to what's going on here than we initially thought. His pants are in the bedroom by the bed. They say that it looks like he's literally just stepped out of them. You know, they're just bunched up on the floor. They are wet from the bottom of the pants up to basically the groin area. His boots, I think, are just sitting on the porch. And they said that Mont never neatly sat his boots beside each other. That he just mm -hmm. like kicked his shoes off and where they landed, that's where they landed. Like things aren't adding up. Inside those pants, they find his cell phone, which was the like major red flag because they said Mont never went anywhere without his cell phone. Do we know if, uh, if the cell phone was damaged because his pants were so wet? No, that's one thing that I just, I'm not sure on. So Dr. Holly said he made a comment that Mont's phone was actually on, but Miss Gill said that she was calling his number and it wasn't going to voicemail or anything, but there's no activity on Mont's phone for that Saturday. So I don't think it was on. I think that they turned it on and maybe don't remember that they turned it on. Right. 
Because, you know, especially back then, cell phones weren't, you know, great for weather. Mm -hmm. or, you know. Because it, like his phone, if you look at the records, after 935, there's no activity at all until about the time they make the missing person report. And at that point, it looks like his phone's turned on and they're checking his voicemail. Hmm. And I assume it was, okay, let's see who was the last person he talked to. You know, did anybody leave voicemail? Like, what could have been going on? And, you know, if he was wet up to his, you know, crotch area or, or waist area, you know, is there a body of water close by that that would be consistent with? There was, I think, a little stream that ran through their property. I guess he could have walked through. It didn't sound like it was that deep, though. It right. sounded more like it was just like runoff. Not like anything you could do anything in, no fishing or anything like that. I don't think they were soaking wet, but it was one of those things like because they were bunched up like that, maybe the water had kind of like absorbed further up the pants. Yeah. And sure. that's why it hadn't dried is because it'd been so bunched up. And that was my thought Could was be, like, yeah. was it really that they had just gotten wet like further down around the ankles and it had just kind of expanded up the pants leg because it had been bunched up? Mm. But I don't know that. And they never tested the water to see if they could compare it to any nearby water source to match it up. Well, I wonder if reason his boots were set next to each other, if they were, you know, waterlogged or whatever, and he poured them out and set them down. Possibly. I mean, Golf cart ends up being found on Monday is the day that they do the first real search where all the agencies are involved. After that Sunday, they find all of this stuff is just not right. They make the call. They report him missing. They realize, okay, not only is his cell phone in his pocket, there's $100 in his pocket, and he's got $200 in his wallet that was in his truck. So he wasn't robbed because Dr. Holly had given him $300. At least to our knowledge, he wasn't robbed. His cell phone's here, all this, all this stuff that's just not right. They report him missing on Sunday. By that time, it's 5 p.m. It's already kind of late in the day. I think the decision was ultimately, it's getting dark. There's not going to be much that we can do. And I don't think this was necessarily on the Holly's part as much as it was maybe um, a call by whoever the law enforcement officers were. I don't that, know if that was the sheriff's office or, AB, or SBI that well, decided I think that. The, I think at first it was the sheriff's office that took the initial report. And it was, it's getting dark. Let's just start fresh tomorrow when we have good daylight. Right. So starting on December 1st, the Macon County Sheriff's Office, along with multiple other agencies, including Alabama State Bureau of Investigation, which was ABI at the time, but now it's just called SBI. They like reorganized the mm -hmm. Hollies, friends, and over 200 volunteers. I mean, that's huge. Began a multi-day search of the 290-acre farm that included aerial flyovers and tracking dogs. So I started calling people to get them out there, and the word spread. And I have a good friend who's in the timber business, and he shut his business down and got all of the guys that work for him. And they walked every inch of the 250 acres we had looking for him. And they squared, they, whatever they call it, they gridded it off and walked the entire place. And of course, he wasn't there. While doing that, they found our uh, golf cart, which was probably... 200 yards from the from the trailer and it had been abandoned it was it was on a route you know and all i had to do was just lift it up and push it and it came right off you know and it was out there there was a somebody found a i don't know a playboy or a penthouse or some kind of magazine off in the woods somewhere and that's all i mean there was nothing between the golf where the golf cart was and our trailer there was a small bridge and a small creek and we kind of wondered if he had gone through taking the golf cart out and then come back and walk through the creek. Well, it would make no sense for him to do that. All he had to do was cross the bridge. But that's the only way I could think of His pants had gotten wet. His boots which were on the front porch were wet. Somebody said that the boots, I didn't see them, that the boots were stacked together on the porch before you go into the house. And I never knew Mont to... When he took his shoes off, they went wherever he took them off. He didn't turn them. He didn't set them. You know, he just waited till he got ready to go put them back on. So that, to me, was very strange. We had gone in. We blocked everything. We had people walking the swamps with waders on. We had a helicopter that had a heat-seeking uh, sensor on the front of it that was flying over the property. I mean, we had hundreds of people out there. 
They were riding four wheelers. They were riding horses. They were walking. I mean, it was it was just unbelievable the number of people we had that were helping. And I had some guys who were truck drivers that I took care of, and they put bulletins all over the United States. I mean, they were in New York. They were in Colorado. They were in California. They were all over everywhere that he was missing. And, you know, this just went on and on and on, and we didn't, didn't really hear anything from them. During the first morning of the search, the family golf cart was found abandoned, and I'm calling it slightly stuck on a tree root because Dr. Holly said, okay, it was stuck, but I could literally by myself just push it off. It wasn't significantly yeah. stuck. It wasn't bogged in the mud. Then right. in that same area of the golf cart, they found a shirt of Mont's, a rechargeable flashlight, still in working condition, according to one of the media articles, and a few other various items. And then there was a gun hmm. that was found. A hunting um, rifle or something? No, it was like a handgun, I believe. All of that's found there. And they did Mont typically carry that gun, or did they leave it at the cabin? Or I think it was Mont's that he carried. I don't know that they left yeah, it out. Yeah, I was going to say I don't think we've asked. Camp. But the scene was really bizarre. And what Doctor Holly told us about the gun was that at the time that it was found, there was no dew on the gun. Hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't like it had been there since Friday or anything. It looked like it had just been there just that day. There was no dew on it and no nothing. Hmm. That's, you know, that's strange. And it's, of course, it's Alabama weather. Who knows? They said that they found his pistol by the golf cart. And the strange thing was that it had been cold that night and there was no dew on the pistol, which made, some, made everybody think, well, maybe it had been planted. I mean, the way it all looked, it certainly looks like it was planted. You know, because even I believe the gun wasn't there the day before and then it showed up. Multiple search and rescue organizations with various types of tracking dogs assisted in the search for Mont, including tracking dogs from Kilby Prison. During the search, scent specific trailing dogs were able to follow Mont's scent from the farm to the Segrist family camp, then from the Segrist camp to a property owned by a Segrist relative directly across County Road 30, where his scent was ultimately lost. We had dogs involved. We had scent specific. I didn't know there were so many different kinds of dogs. Solid scent. Yeah. Uh, disappeared. They brought in a bunch of uh, dogs that just followed the first scent that they that they hit, and they followed the scent off from the trailer off into the woods somewhere. We didn't know whose scent it was. Then they brought in uh, some specific dogs, and they gave these scent specific dogs his clothing and let them smell his scent on the clothing, and they followed his scent from the trailer up to the main road and two miles down the road to Granny's house. Then they started at Granny's house, and they followed his scent from Granny's house across the road, which is probably 100 yards to the trailer, and then they lost the scent at the trailer. And I asked them, I said, you know, why would they lose the scent at the trailer? I said, what will make them lose the scent? They said, well, alcohol will, drugs will, and trauma and death will. So we kind of assumed that whatever happened, it happened at the trailer. Now, you know, I mean, is that true or not? I don't know. Uh, apparently, there was an area behind the trailer on the ground where there was a burn spot. And we thought maybe somebody had just poured gasoline on the burn spot to burn off the DNA or something. I mean, that was all just assumption on our part. Sure. Every scenario goes through your head. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And still today. After exhausting all reasonable search efforts, authorities called off the search for Mont on December 4th, 2003, but stated that the investigation would remain active. So, well, it, and I, you may have covered it and, and I missed it, but how far away was the golf cart from the, the hunting place? I mean, the whole area between there and the back, isn't it only like a mile? It wasn't very far, though. Mm hmm. I mean, it was. I think it was found pretty quickly once they were on the property it's, looking. It's it's hard to say. I guess you know. One, I don't know the property, but you know, you, you have a Tahoe at one location, you have a golf cart at another location, and then you have the hunting camp at another location. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wouldn't make sense to if the truck was fine. You know, no issues with it, or the Tahoe, and the golf cart was fine except for being stuck on a you know, rude or whatever. It just, it don't make sense when, you know, nothing broke down for him to have to walk. That's weird, you know, and, and I would like, to, if we could possibly see on a map, you know, to see where they are in relation to each other. 
That because if one's going one direction and one's going completely the other direction, that's just um, strange. I think the golf cart's going to be in the opposite direction of where the Tahoe was. If the truck was messed up or the Tahoe was messed up, you know, then he walked to get the golf cart to go back to fix the Tahoe, but it don't appear that the Tahoe was, was messed up. Mm-mm. And vice versa wouldn't make sense. And it's just for just him to be operating both those vehicles and, and walking and just strange. It is strange. So they take the search dogs out and they have the live scent dogs that are scent specific tracking Mont scent. And they track Mont scent from the Highly Camp to the Seagrass Camp where the Tahoe is. And then they go directly across the County Road 30 from the Seagrass Camp to a property. So there's Seagrass Lane is right across the street from where Granny's house was. And so there's a property in the corner where Seagrass Lane and County Road 30 connect. And it's like right across the street from Granny's house. And that's where the live scent tracking dog loses Mont's scent. And that property is also owned by Seagrist. So his scent is lost there. So he had to walk pretty much for the dog to pick the scent up. It wasn't in the Tahoe, possibly in the golf cart. I still think it's unlikely. But for the dog to pick it up, um, especially a fresh scent, then that would indicate to me, in my opinion, that he walked that, which adds more strangeness to, you know, why did he walk from there to there? Ten days later... On December 14th, 2003, the Holly family increased the reward amount to $15,000. And Dr. Holly told local media outlets that SBI was continuing to investigate and interview people. What we've been told is that SBI actually set up essentially roadblocks out in the area and they were stopping people driving through, asking them, you know, about information. Had they seen anything? Did they know anything? Yada, yada. You know, a few weeks went by. We had all, I remember the search parties being out here. Um, You know, there's just a lot of rumors going on. And then I talked to the ABI investigators, of course, and told them, you know, what all I'd seen. And then it kind of like just took a turn for, you know, the worst. Like then all of a sudden my dad was being uh, accused, you know, of it. And um, I remember the ABI investigators having a, um, I guess, a mobile post, you would call it, up there at Bradford's Church. Mm-hmm. Um, they actually came to my work. I worked at Subway in high school, and they would come up there and ask questions. They would be sent outside of my high school, like, waiting for me to leave. They would ask me questions. But it got to be really stressful on me. And I also helped at the diner down here that my aunt owned. And just mm-hmm. some of the rumors that were going around, somebody spray-painted in the bathroom at the gas station, uh, Bob, which is my dad, and Frank are killers, that my stepmom was seen getting in the vehicle with Mont that night um, at the gas station. That's why my dad did it. But my dad couldn't even walk. He, you know, had just had total hip replacement surgery. I mean, it was causing me a lot of issues to the point where Papa got with Sean Lockridge. It was either Sean Lockridge or Billingsley, and um, he told him he wanted to do a lie detector test um, so he could try and help clear his name. So he did that, and I found didn't know this until all of this started back up a few months ago that Papa also volunteered to do a DNA test, and so they cleared him of that as well. And just so that we kind of have it cleared on there, too, when you say, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but something about, you know, that your dad was being accused of it, kind of clear, like, Mont- involved in Mont's disappearance or his death or just being just involved in general in the whole situation with what happened he, to they, the rumor was that he was the one that made him disappear completely like his death on december 19th of 2003 mont turned 34 21 days after he was last seen and how sad is that that his family couldn't celebrate his birthday i'm sure they wanted to but there's not a lot of celebration to be had knowing what was going on when you hear about cases that actually happen right around the holidays, it makes it, I think, all the worse sometimes. Yeah. And his birthday and Christmas and Thanksgiving all in kind of one sh- short, you know, time span. I think about Christian Bull. Mm. His mom got the call right around Christmas. And then we also have Riles Chapman, who disappeared around Christmas. And yeah. it seems to happen more than you realize, I think. I agree. Yeah. Then actually, on Christmas Day, December 25th of 2003, almost a month later, 
SBI Special Agent Mark Whitaker confirmed the investigation was ongoing and that they had been following up on the tips received. He called Mont's case perplexing due to the fact that there were no signs of a struggle at any of the locations involved, and they couldn't identify a crime scene. The Holly mm-hmm. family also announced they were increasing the reward again to $50,000. In January of 2004, we're passing the holidays. New Year's has passed. They're still wondering where Mond is. It's so hard to know what we knew because we didn't really know anything. Yeah, we didn't know what was going on. I mean, there were just so many strange loose ends. And I mean, it was just incredibly confusing. But on the 14th at 10.30 in the morning, almost seven weeks after his disappearance, investigators received a call related to a body being found approximately a half a mile from where Armand's Tahoe was located in an unused grain silo behind the back 40, a restaurant owned and operated by Ted Johnson. In about six weeks, it was on a Sunday, and Gail and I were sitting here watching TV, and I told her, I said, you know, I said, I don't think anybody ever walked the area behind the Back 40 restaurant, which was where the grain silos were. And I said, why don't we just see if we can't ride out there and look in that area and let me walk the woods. And I mean, it was a big open field anyway, and there were some woods around and there were a couple of ponds. So we rode out there and Ted Johnson owned the Back 40 restaurant and owned the land back there that the grain silos were on. And I stopped at the Back 40 and asked him if we could go in. And he said yes and told us how to get in. There was a cluster of houses and you drove diagonally across the grain field toward the grain silos, and then there was a road around the side of the silos across the dam. On one of the ponds, there was uh, woods behind the pond. So we drove across the field, went around the grain silo, which was where it was found, and we were probably within 20 yards of the grain silo, across the dam, and parked. And I got out and walked the woods behind the pond. And of course, there was nothing in the woods. And got back in the car and uh, tried to start the car, and the car was dead. I mean, I put the key in the ignition, and it did nothing. No lights came on, no nothing. There was no growling, there was nothing. So I thought maybe I had a loose wire, and I got out and checked the wires, and I tapped on the starter, and I did all this stuff, and nothing. I mean, we couldn't get any power to anything. So I called a friend of mine, and he was going to send somebody out and pick us up. And, of course, he crawled on me about us being out there by ourselves and everything that had happened. And uh, I told him, I said, let me try one more time. And I got back in the car, and I put the key in the ignition, and I turned the key, and it started. And Gail took that to mean that little Mont was trying to tell us he was there. And I mean, you know, how do you know? So we went on around the field, and of course we didn't find anything, and we left, and that following Wednesday, we were there on a Sunday, that following Wednesday is when they found him in the grain silo. While border collies were housed in the kennels in the rear of the barn connected to the silo, Harold Johnson, Ted's brother, told local media that the silo had not been used since the 80s, and no one had been inside the silo for a long time. Neighbors stated the area surrounding the silo had been searched in early November or December searches, but Special Agent Whitaker could not verify whether the cadaver dogs had searched the barn and the surrounding property or whether anyone had checked inside the silo at all. Investigators did not immediately confirm the identity of the body, but stated given the location in relation to where Mont had disappeared, it was possible it was him. Somebody's got to know you know, I mean, obviously they know more than they're saying, but, you know, why Why is it such a big cover-up? You know, what if it was an overdose, I've worked cases where people's overdosed at people's houses and they freaked out and took, you know, the, the body and, you know, put it out somewhere. But if he overdosed at his own camp, it would be, you know, mindless to take him to another location because you were really implicating yourself in something. Uh, mm-hmm. When the easiest thing to do would be just leave. So that tells me if it is an overdose, then he probably done it at the Seacrest's where they didn't want, you know, the issue because, you know, somebody OD in at somebody's house and that's going to implicate them in drug activity or whatever. And, you know, then that would make more sense, you know, but you got concealing a body, you know, you got so many things besides murder. It wouldn't make sense to me for them to cover that up unless there was an altercation or something. Yeah. Because, you know, evidently we're dealing with, a you know, a bunch of intelligent people. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're not dealing with your usual people that are not thinking straight. I mean, these are, from what I gather, pretty educated individuals. 
Right. I guess the thing that confuses me is it, you know, it looks like such chaos at the camp, but it also looks like chaos at the Seagrass property. And so it's almost as if something abrupt happened at the camp and then immediately either he drove or or was taken to the other property. Because, I mean, even if he was just being lazy and left things, you know, the way they were with a golf cart and all of the other things, you know, just the camp itself doesn't seem like enough. Everything else on top of that seems like something had to have happened at the camp also, not just at the same property. And so, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile that, I guess, is where I'm going with that, you know? Well, somebody's got to come forward with some kind of information. Now, if he was high, let's just go for a minute and, and, and say that he was, you know, um, high on cocaine or whatever, which is also hard to overdose if you're high on the stimulant. But mm-hmm. if say he was high and he done all this crazy joyriding with the golf cart and the walking and the, you know, which wouldn't be too far-fetched, you know, leaving this Tahoe, doing erratic stuff, you know, okay, well, we can kind of somewhat see that. So was he high and then he drink beer or, you know what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. the toxicology and the autopsy are huge in this, you know. And I so, just can't help but wonder, you know, they aren't sharing the autopsy with us. For whatever reason, they're not. I mean, if, if maybe it's just simply the investigation, but, you know, I don't completely think that's the only reason. But you would think that there's something in the autopsy that either conflicts with the idea that there was an overdose or basically overrides it did they find you know some sort of indication that there was a another weapon or whatever a broken hyoid you know like from strangulation or you know whatever Um, and i think that kind of goes into so when mont's found you know he's not found until january right it's like january 14th so almost seven weeks later when he's found he's has a t-shirt on and he has a pair of jeans which is unusual for him to wear the how they say, like, he normally wore, like, Carhartt-type pants, like khaki pants, that there was a pair of jeans folded on top of him or bladed across him. He didn't have them on. And that's bizarre. But those are the only things that are ever mentioned. There's no mention of shoes. There's no mention of socks. There's no mention of jackets, underwear, nothing that you would think for this to have been a time period where it's, like, freezing cold weather Mm-hmm. You're out going to hang out with a group of people. Nothing about what was ultimately found, at least as far as what we know, says this was just a stop by at a party. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, it, it seems to me like he left the party at some point and went back to his camp. You know, he I don't think he left the camp voluntarily. You know, maybe the pants come off when they were dragging, you know, his body, which if they were dragging a body, it leads you to believe it's one person. Mm-hmm. You know, and if the pants come down during the dragon, it would be hard to redress, you know, the deceased body. Yeah. And yeah. maybe they fold them up and threw them on top. But it just don't sound to me like he left the camp voluntarily that time of year being cold. And, you know, down here when it's cold like that, and it, I, I would be surprised if it wasn't rainy. But, you know, you're not going to go anywhere without shoes. This not going to yeah. happen. Right. Yeah. It really did yeah. sound like he was like mid, either mid changing clothes or mid undress or, you know, something to that degree. Yeah, it sounds like maybe somebody come up or something and that would explain whatever happened there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could say excited delirium or something. Well, you know, I don't know his drug habits, you know, and, and decided delirium, it, it is it is a thing. Like I said, without knowing his drug usage history it would be hard to tell because the side of delirium and now like i said i'm not a doctor and any defense attorney will you know call me out on that anytime but i wouldn't think it's as prevalent with somebody that is used to using cocaine or used to using a certain drug a side of delirium usually is an onset of someone who's used a large amount of drugs that they're not used to mm-hmm. or use a drug that's been laced with something different mm-hmm. or a combination of drugs that you know, cause it. I, I wouldn't think it's that typical uh, for him to get a side of delirium and run away into the woods, take his pants off, fold them up, lay them on his body and die. I mean, I, I wouldn't think that would be possible. And so the guy that calls in is Johnny Johnson. It's Ted Johnson's son. He calls a conservation agent to report that he's found a body in this silo behind his dad's restaurant. Calls and a conservation a, agent? He yeah. calls a conservation agent. <laughs> 
who calls in everybody else, the other agencies. And does this conservation agent, does he like question, why did you call me? <laughs> yeah. That's the first. The yeah. silo is a, it's like a big silo. It goes all the way to the ground. It's a, like, it looks huge in the pictures. And it's unused. There, it, it's not a, a used. It's not used. Silo. They said it hadn't been used since like the 80s. It has a door on the ground, but there is no door actually on it. It's just an opening that you walk into. And there's a barn attached to it. And supposedly the Johnsons raised border collies and they housed them in this connected barn. And Ted Johnson's brother says he actually was, I I don't know, like 150 yards or something from the silo a week or so before washing out a trailer, something, had no idea that there was a body in there. But Johnny Johnson supposedly just happens to walk by on this day, him and his child, and they look in and see this and he calls this conservation agent. I think initially he thought it was um, due to the level of decomposition, maybe an animal, maybe. Right. But I don't know. Which may have been where the rumors came from initially. Yeah. The, yeah. He had a shirt on, correct? He did have a shirt on. Um, in my we mind, don't really know what condition a, this shirt looked like it was in, though. You have a decomposing body. You smell that, right? Yeah. Well, you know, therefore, again, several years ago, we had a, somebody call in a, a dead body up in the mountains. And I was the first investigator there. And, in Talladega County, and there was just a little bit of the foot sticking up, but they had, you know, poured lawn and stuff on him, concealed the odor. But, you know, the, the, the weather plays a huge part of that. If it's hot outside, I mean, you know, obviously you'll smell a body a lot further away, mm-hmm. you know, and it'd be a lot more, you know, a pungent smell. If it's mm-hmm. cold and damp, it can keep the smell down. Gotcha. Uh, you know, so that's the thing think- that's the weather. So I guess that would be a good thing to look at, like not just the weather on the day that it happened, but between then and when he was found. Because, I mean, theoretically, if all we know is that his body was found in the silo. So, you know, we can we have to make the assumption until we know differently that that's where he was the day that he died. You know, we don't know that. But and I kind of that he was there the entire time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And if he was there the entire time. And the weather fluctuated with the border collies there. You would think that, one, there would be people there taking care of the dogs. Right. And two, that the dogs would pick up on something. I mean, I can't imagine that it was a consistently very cold and not able to detect a body there at all that entire time. It just w- it just seems almost implausible, especially once, you know, if the, if the weather came above, in, you know, above 50 degrees even, it probably would, I would think. Oh, yeah. You know, and I, yeah. I'm surprised there wasn't, you know, e- even though it was inside a, a silo, I'm surprised there wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, birds and stuff and yeah. crows or, you know, yeah. whatever. And it was I an open that, door. So, you know. You know, and, and that's the thing. There's pluses and, and, and minuses in this case with that, with a body being found inside. You know, the plus is obviously you don't have the overhead vultures and stuff and you don't have as many large animal activity but you still have mice you know rodents that kind of thing as far as the weather the weather in my opinion and therefore again i'm not a doctor Mm -hmm. the weather shouldn't hinder the cause of death that much and the time because the time of year in my experience it wouldn't throw it off that much had it been july or august uh just the weather alone would have presented a huge Huge obstacle. In January of 04, it says the maximum temperature was 75. The average max temperature for the month was 57, with the average temperature being 45 and the average minimum being 33. Just above freezing. Mm -hmm. Well, and like I said, I mean, you know, that's so, and it being inside, you know, it's going to hinder the smell, you know, from outside of it. On January 15th, Using dental records, Alabama Department of Forensics confirmed the body found in the silo was Mont. In a statement to WSFA, Special Agent Scott Donovan said the area around the silo was not part of the original search. And that was something that sources had told us, that they used a road that ran near the silo to actually get into the property behind where the scent was lost. Mm -hmm. They never actually went over to the silo. Right. Um, Basically, they the think that direction. maybe some, maybe some of the volunteers on foot maybe searched around that area. But like as far as law enforcement went and the search dogs, they were never in that area. Right, right. 
On January 18th of 2004, 2 30 in the afternoon, family and friends gathered at the Fraser Memorial United Methodist Church to honor Mont and offer support to the family. Yeah, there are over a thousand people at Mont's funeral, and you don't see that many people very much. Among those in attendance were honorary pallbearers Dee Fitzpatrick, Bowen Bollard, Mark Kitchens, Judd Blunt, Will Blunt, Bill Eskridge, Peyton Chapman, John Walter Parker, Michael Cumberus, Frank Thomas, Tommy Gamble, Hamp Green, Rob Newton, Chris Williams, Scott McMillan, Michael Baldry, and Alfred Goings. They wanted to have a party after the funeral. I said, well, if y'all want to come over here and have it, that's fine with me. I said, but the garage is not a good place, but you can't come in the house and you can't drink. And they said, well, we're going to come over anyway. So they all came over and partied in the garage. And when they stopped, the light in the garage kept flickering on and off, on and off, on and off. And they said they knew Mont was right in the middle of the party with them. A week after Mont was found, Major Ken Halford told the Montgomery advisor the investigation into Mont's death was ongoing and ADFS was still processing evidence. However, due to a backlog at the forensics lab, there could be a delay in getting evidence back. And is there not a backlog? I know. We hear this too often. And it seems like years and years pass for some people that almost as if once they say it's going to take some time, then they don't. (laughs) You know, it almost seems like it just sits there sometimes. So in 2004, there was a Macon County grand jury. But, you know, those proceedings are secrets. So you don't really know a lot about what goes on there. We actually just found that on accident and were able to confirm it. Then I guess nothing happens with that. And in 2005, they convene another grand jury, but they move it to Montgomery County instead, which I thought was weird. Well, they probably did that because of the political ties with the family. Well, and then- That was my thinking is that you typically only move change venues when you know you can't get a fair, unbiased jury. Well, and I would like to know what the grand jury was looking at back again, like we said about the autopsy. If it was a clear cut of uh, overdose or accidental, they would have never convened the grand jury. Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. You know, because the only time in Alabama, and I know you can get a grand jury if you want them to look at it, if it's a high profile, just so some, just to put the buck on someone else, you know, if the prosecutor wanted to say, well, let a grand jury look at it and see what they think. But that's very unusual, in my opinion. You know, the only time you really convene a grand jury is to see if there's any criminal activity. And, and uh, you would have to have something to take to the grand jury. And it looks like. Just based on our understanding, we don't have a solid date on when that Macon County grand jury convened. We just have a general that it occurred in 04. We think it occurred like early to mid-2004. So it looks like that grand jury convened. And then it was after that grand jury convened that Governor Riley issues the reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the persons responsible. And we actually obtained a copy of the proclamation. It's been... A little bit of a journey to get a copy of this. But the proclamation didn't necessarily state Mont had been murdered. That was what the newspaper article said. But what the proclamation did say was that authenticated information has reached this office regarding the death of Mont Holly IV of Montgomery. Information indicating he was last seen on November 28, 2003 on County Road 30. His body was found on January 14, 2004 in Macon County, Cause of death has not yet been determined. And, whereas it appears that the perpetrator or perpetrators of said crimes are unknown and there are no suspects, and whereas the circumstances surrounding the crimes indicate that every effort should be made to apprehend and convict the perpetrator or perpetrators. That's pretty telling. It is. You don't have to say it's a murder when you say it like that, do you? Exactly, because it says, you know, dot, 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 because I'm not going to read all of that. Mm Mm-hmm. Hereby issues this proclamation offering a reward of $5,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the guilty person or persons, provided that he or she has not been arrested at the time of issuance of this proclamation. In that same month, SBI investigators set up headquarters at a Macon County church and began re-interviewing witnesses and re-canvassing the area, including obtaining new aerial photographs. 
Although Special Agent Whitaker declined to provide many details, he did tell WSFA they were making progress and getting closer to the truth behind Mont's murder. One reason we're out here is because we've made contact with potential witnesses and we're now interviewing them. WSFA later reported the SBI spoke to approximately 25 people as part of that interview slash re-interview process. Which is nuts. I mean, that's quite a few people, like, all of a sudden to start interviewing. Yep. Well, that's telling in itself because uh, the governor's office would have to have some kind of probable cause to even issue something like that. They're calling this crime. crime. Right. Yes. And that there are persons responsible. Well, that would only make sense for a grand jury and everything. And the governor's office wouldn't issue something unless they had some kind of probable cause or at least reasonable suspicion that a homicide or something would have occurred. I mean, that they wouldn't do that. So that tells you right there that there's enough there for the governor's office to believe that there was a crime. Yep. And I think that's huge. I, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just thinking about the grand jury and then, like you said, about the governor reward. Like I said, there's somebody that they're looking at. Yep, that, the grand jury, and the fact that even now, 20 years later, you can't get a copy of the autopsy. And this was, the letter that we got was September 16th, 2022. It's a district attorney, Jeremy Dorr, I think that's how you say his last name, has notified the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences that this case remains under criminal investigation. Yeah, well, with, with all that together, then, I mean, there's definitely enough to believe there's a crime there. And just long afterwards, the only crime they would be worried about would be, you know, homicide. In early 2022, the Hileys met with SBI to discuss Mont's case. Somebody sent us Mont's name in yeah. July, and it took us like a month to verify that it was actually still an open case. It was really ironic because the Hileys had met with SBI in early 2022, and they had were having another meeting. And so mm -hmm. in June, we got Mont's name in June. It took us a month or so to verify that it had not been solved. And then we made our post in July. And mm -hmm. it was a day or two before the Hollies actually had their meeting with SBI. And so they go to their meeting and nobody knows where this post came from. Like the Hollies thought they did it, thought SBI did it, SBI thought the Hollies did it. And then we end up getting connected with the Hollies and realize that all the information we have is not accurate. And so we need to do an update. So after we got a hold of the case, you know, and learned more about Mont's case, you know, we made definitely made some updates to the information that we've shared. In October of 2022, the highly secured a digital billboard for Mont that goes live near Exit 11 in Montgomery in an effort to renew public interest. The digital billboard directed anyone with information to contact the SBI. So looking at all of this and taking into consideration, you know, kind of the assortment of things that were found, you know, you're looking at potentially 30 different crime scenes because you've got the farm, I guess, or four. If you, I'm just lumping well, yeah, the farm that, into one because the golf cart was on the farm property. On the property. But and if I don't you think separate it, that it then, that's, then that's four. But yeah. um if you just keep it all together, then you've got the farm, Granny's. the Seagrass property, Granny's, where the Tahoe's found. Well, t I guess technically still four, because then you've also got where the scent was lost. Right. Um, I was just going to say the one across the street. Because. It's so a separate. Yeah. You know, they had the dogs over there. That's one area. Because one thing, if you have live dogs, that's where they lose the scent. My thought is, is it because that's where his live scent stopped? Is that where he died? Right there. I would think they probably put him in a vehicle right there. You think so? Mm-hmm. Talking about him walking, over, like if he walked, what about running? Like, is it possible? Because I'm with you. I don't think he voluntarily left the Holly camp. No. Uh, that has been kind of our, like, working theory this whole time is that he didn't voluntarily leave the Holly camp. And is it possible, like, he was still alive when maybe he got to the Seacrest camp, that he mm -hmm. ran he ran from where his Tahoe was across the street. Oh, well, that's possible. Yeah. One thing they told the Hollies about that scent being lost over there was it was like close to, um, you know, an outside air conditioning unit and that possibly that sucked the scent up in it. And that may, it may very well, you know, it may would very be, well. Would the filters of the AC have given any indication? To me, because it's a road, right? Well, it's like right across the street. Are you talking about where the since lost? Yeah. It's like right there behind a trailer. And then that's just all like 
it's a property and then it's all like woods. There's ponds back behind it and stuff. I would think that he got into a vehicle there to trailer or something. I would think he got into a vehicle because if he would have went inside the trailer, I think the dogs would have tracked it up to the door. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You That's would think the, the like, air conditioning place. unit is going to be kind of somewhere, like, back here behind the house, probably. It's not going to be in the front. Right. So you would assume if they're thinking that the air conditioning unit is what sucked up his scent, then you're going to assume he's walking behind the house and that he would have been going along. He wouldn't have just been like, oh, let me go back down the road. That doesn't really make sense. And the dogs would have, wouldn't they have picked that back up at some right. point? And the AC unit, I mean, I, I can't see it because, you know, the dogs, you know, they go off of it's going to be sent on the ground and everything and not just in the air, you know. And yeah. I couldn't see it being strong unless it was just next to it being strong enough to interfere. I mean, to me, it made sense. There was a vehicle back there and he got into a vehicle there. Mm-hmm. You know, that, and maybe they left from there and went back to the camp. Yeah. Maybe they were giving him a ride. You know, that's definitely something that needs to be looked in. Yeah. And I just don't understand why he would have been over there anyway. Unless he was running from somebody at the other camp. Yeah. Because there wouldn't have been people at that trailer. But not hanging out. Like, not his age. You know, that was a Seeger's family member, but not, like, that's not where they were all having the party. This wouldn't have been an area that he would have been hanging out. And been like, oh, let me just go over here and see what, you know, Jimbo's doing. So where it's lost, you know, it's kind of like on that trail where they could have made that, like, going to that silo. They could have, they would have had a shot to the silo without getting on the main road. Right. And it's obviously there's not a lot of vehicles there. I mean, a lot of um, houses. There's not a lot of houses there. It's all wooded. And even back then, even with it being open, it's not like it would have been right on the road where anybody would have seen anything. And it's late at night. So a lady commented on one of our posts. It was on public comment on one of our posts and said, my brother saw the truck leaving the Holly property around five that morning. And her brother knows whose truck it was. Her brother says it was. Well, you know, that's that's huge. And then this question about whether there's planted evidence. You have this question of why would somebody be leaving the Hollies, not in Mont's Tahoe, at five in the morning, four and five in the morning? Mm hmm. Yeah, that that's definitely a lot of questions that's got to be answered. You know, maybe they, they're gathering more evidence. What evidence do you think would be, like, what do you think the smoking gun evidence, the necessary evidence needed? Because you only get one shot. We hear that all the time. You get one shot to make your case. And right. you don't want to risk a technicality. You don't want to risk not having strong enough evidence against the person that you're pressing charges against. Like, what do you think looking at all of this is what you need to have a solid case? Well, in my opinion, the biggest thing would be being able to put, you know, a suspect with the victim. Putting that together would be huge. Um, You know, hopefully they process some of these vehicles to see if there's anything from the victim in those vehicles that could tie them back, you know, with physical evidence or an eyewitness, you know, somebody that comes forward. And a lot of times with cold cases, um, you know, relationships change, you know, people that normally the back then when it happened didn't have children and now they have children and they feel differently about stuff. Um, somebody coming forth with some, with some information, either eyewitness or firsthand knowledge or some physical evidence, you know, without the autopsy is hard to say because if it you know, if it's a if it's a firearm related or, you know, uh, a stabbing or something, then you would say you need that weapon. But us not knowing is hard to say, but somebody's got to come forward. So I would think with the time lapse and everything that I know, a witness or firsthand account would be what you would have to have. Now, how important you've had some luck recently, actually, with cold case and updated DNA analysis. Right. So how important is it in cases like this, in cold cases, in rerunning evidence that has that potential DNA and checking that again and updating that? Rerunning evidence is huge. It's, um, you know, I don't know if they still have the pants and everything, but it's huge because the technology nowadays versus the technology in 2003 or 2004, rather, is, you know, it's, it's a lot better. You need a lot smaller amounts of DNA to get an analysis versus what you had then. My suggestion, you know, is private labs 
private labs, in my opinion, in my experience in the past few years, we've had a lot of good success with them because, number one, they're not overwhelmed. You know, unfortunately, the state lab is overwhelmed with cases coming in, you know, daily. So these private labs are more apt to put more time in it, you know, and they typically have the best technology available. You know, if there's any evidence that they think could be re-looked at, I would strongly suggest uh, a private lab. Like I said, we've had a lot of success in the past few years with cold cases and, and utilizing private labs. We've identified people that's been missing for 30 years and 30 plus years, you know, and um, it's huge. Do you think that, you know, obviously we don't know what evidence they still have or, you know, the manner in which it's been kept? So the quality of the evidence that's been kept, it, you know, that degrades over time or, Sometimes, you know, I guess it can actually become unusable, but say it hasn't been kept 100 percent up to standard, I guess, or quality. Is it possible that that can still be used now? Yes, it, it is. And we had a case that was 20 something years old. The evidence was stored improperly and it did, of course, it manipulated, you know, the evidence and, and definitely, you know, hurt our uh, evidentiary case. But I still believe there was some usable evidence on there. Um, we were fortunate enough to get evidence elsewhere, mm -hmm. but it all depends on, you know, like I said, the, the lab. Some labs, they will analyze smaller hair particles. Some labs will, you know, they specialize in blood stains. You know, it's just, it depends on what kind of evidence you have to, to see which one you send to. Yeah. So what and, do you think the chances of moving this forward are? Well, I've told people, I've said it a lot recently in the past couple of years with these 30 plus year old cases and 20 plus year old cases. You know, I think as long as the family and people like y'all um, that are out here trying to get answers and pushing forward, I think there's a great chance. I think it's only over and when everybody gives up. And that's my opinion. And, you know, getting some people looking in on it and trying to help like y'all were doing, I think is huge for these families. From what I hear from y'all, it, it seems the family is very motivated. So all that is nothing but a plus in my book. You know, whether you believe in the Lord or you don't believe in the Lord, divine intervention happens. It's happened to me on several cases. And I think sometimes it's just it, it comes at the time it's supposed to come. You know, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's just not time. And sometimes it's just it don't happen because of, you know, uncooperative witnesses or uh, lack of, you know, good law enforcement. I mean, there's so many things that play a part of this. But the you know biggest thing that I can tell anybody is don't give up because when you give up, it's over. From your perspective, talking to people like us as advocates, what would you suggest our next step would be to help this family? The next step I would do if it were me, I would try to find someone at that party or at that get together, whatever you want to call it, you know, either through a family member or a friend or whatever. But somebody there has to know something. I hope more people start talking because like you said, somebody knows something. It makes me really sad that he hasn't been able to see his nephews grow up because I know he would be so incredibly proud of the athletes they were, the people they are, the fathers. I just think that it's tragic for me as his sister for me not to be able to share my life and my kids' lives with him. It's like a big hole in our heart. And, you know, it's... We talk about him, we remember him, but life would have just been so much sweeter had they been able to know him and really be with him and experience, you know, the incredible person that he was. So that's the thing that makes me the most sad. And it's tragic because it didn't have to happen. There will never be closure, but at least we'd have answers. Whoever did it, they took a son, they took a brother, they took an uncle, they took a great uncle. They took somebody away from a family that was loving and miss him every day. And, you know, I, I, it just makes me incredibly sad. And I hope whoever did it suffers every day with themselves. I mean, that's terrible to say, but I hope that somewhere in them, it's eating them alive knowing what they've done. If you could talk to the people that have the information right now or the person responsible, what would you tell them? What would I tell them? I would just say, I just don't know how somebody could live knowing they took another person's life 
and not ever tell or ever confess that anything did it. Of course, I know why, but I just couldn't live with something like that. And you think every day that somebody's going to say, you know, it's time. I need to fess up because the world is going to come to an end. And you better be a Christian and you better believe because you're not going to be up there with us. I may forgive, but I'll never forget. You know, I think that there's some people who were involved in this who have covered the whole thing up for a long time. And uh, I realized that I probably ought to forgive them, but before I forgive them, I got to figure out who it is. Have they told y'all definitively, yes, we think he was murdered, and yes, we have an idea of who it is? I mean, I think they have, but I don't know. Have they ever directly said it, or have they just kind of hinted at it? Yes, they have. They have not directly said we think thus and such did it, Mm -hmm. but they think that the whole thing started at the secrets at Granny's house, and whatever happened, happened from there. If you have any information about the murder of Mont Holly, please contact Alabama State Bureau of Investigation at 334-676-7870 or the SBI Crime Hotline at 800-392-8011. You can also submit an anonymous tip on their website, which will be linked below in the episode description. You can also send us a message via our website, ACCA social media pages, or send us an email. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Spotify for Podcasters, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy, artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening. Justice may be delayed, but the victims remain unforgotten.